work a void attorney at law, giving you your legal lunch break. Now you all, this channel is dedicated to making sure you know and understand your employment law rights. And also, you know what to do when those employment law rights are violated. Today, we're going to talk about what to do when you receive your dismissal and notice of rights letter from the EEOC. It's typically what I call your right to sue letter. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the first steps you need to take when you receive that right to sue letter, the documents that you need to start collecting when you receive your right to sue letter, and lastly, how much your case can be worth. So let's hop right on in. First, you all, when you receive your right to sue letter, you need to read it. I know that seems super basic. However, you do not receive right to sue letters on a day to day basis. And that right to sue letter is packed with information that's very pertinent to your case. And it also it can make or break your case. So it, you really need to read it. So what we're going to do is we're going to review a right to sue letter, a sample one, and we're going to talk about each component of that right to sue letter. Let's look at right to sue letter now. So when you receive your EOC right to sue letter, one of the things you're gonna receive is this document, legit. This is the document you're going to receive. And I'm just gonna go through this document so you can get a clear understanding of how you need to read this document. Now, first, when you receive this, you're gonna see the two, right? And the two is just gonna be your name and your address. And that's gonna be why it's so important for you to make sure that you include your, your correct email address and your correct um, actually mailing address to the EEOC. Also, it makes make sure that you are updating that address on a continuous basis, right? Because sometimes these EEOC um, investigations can take easily 180 days, easily much more than that, longer than that. And that means if you move, that means it's the onus is on you to keep your address and keep your information up to date with the EEOC. Secondly, you're gonna see the from. The from is going to be the office in which you file your EEOC charge with. Here in Indianapolis, it's gonna be the Indianapolis District Office. It's located on 101 West Ohio Street. So that's gonna be the address that you see on your EEOC charge. Um, thirdly, you're gonna see your EEOC charge number. Now the EEOC charge number is gonna usually start off with the 470, then it's going to go on to the 220. And then it's actually going to go on to um, the actual just random number. So, but it's the identifier of your EEOC charge. Because that's why it's very important to make sure that you know the charge. And once you even follow your charge, that you keep that number in your personal effects because you want to make sure you can reference that charge if you have to call the EEOC office. So that's why it's very important for you to make sure that you have knowledge of that number because it's the identifier of your actual case. But uh, fourthly, it's going to be the EEOC representative. Now, the EEOC representative is going to be someone who has been designated by the EEOC to investigate your charge. Um, typically, it's probably um, a random person um, throughout the EEOC who's going to investigate your charge. You'll know that person's name, and then that person's name will also be on your EEOC dismissal of notice of rights. Also, there's going to be the telephone number. So the telephone number to um, either the investigator or even the district office is going to be on this um, document. Just in case if you receive it, you have some questions in regards to it, you can definitely call that number and get some of your, answer, your questions answered. Now, the most important portion of this document is going to be in the middle of this page, right? So right here, which says the EOC is closing its file on this charge for the following reason, right? And so I'm going to go through all of the reasons as to why the EOC will close your charge of discrimination. So the first, it says the facts alleged in the charge fail to state a claim under any of the statutes enforced by the EOC, right? And so if you've listened to any of my videos before you know the EEOC is only going to investigate employment discrimination based on your protected class, right? So it means that it's not going to investigate any discrimination um, based on housing or any discrimination that has occurred in a restaurant or, or public uh, building, right, when you are a customer. 
This is going to be an investigation and this is going to take place in regards to your employment and it's going to be due to your protected class, right? So it means that you're saying that your employer has discriminated against you based on Title VII, which is your race or your color, your national origin, your religion, your gender, or even your sexual orientation, or you've been harassed, right, by racially harassed or even uh, sexually harassed or even harassed by, based on your disability. That's going to be something the EOC um, actually investigates. Also, the, the EOC is going to investigate any uh, discrimination based on your disability by your employer and any uh, dis uh, discrimination based on your age by your employer. So those are kind of really the big ticket items and the big um, statutes in which the EEOC is going to investigate. They're not gonna investigate anything else besides employment matters and employment matters that are discriminatory due to your protected class. So make sure you understand that, okay? And so if this, uh, if this box is checked, it means that you didn't say the claim or the EEOC is saying that it's based on discrimination by your employer. Um, so that's why that box is checked. Now, it doesn't mean that you may not have a case against your employer. You know, hear me out. It may, it doesn't mean that. It just means that it doesn't, it, the case that you have against your employer is not going to go through the EEOC. And so what I would encourage you to do is, you know, you can do some Google research, but you also will contact an attorney and say, look, this is what has taken place. The, I received this EEOC notice of right uh, of sue, uh, they're saying that I didn't state a claim uh, under a statute enforced by the EEOC. What do I do? How can I move forward? And maybe your employer will be able to best help you. The another check mark is your allegations did not involve a disability as defined by the Americans with Disability Act. Right, and this is, I've never seen this checked at all. Uh, and it's because the Americans with Disabilities Act actually defines disability very, very broadly, right? And so if this is shared is that you didn't give the EEOC information to believe that you're suffering from a disability, right? And so that's why that would be checked. The, the third is the respondent employs less than the required number of employees or is not otherwise covered by the statute. There's, it's very, very hard for an employer not to be covered by the statute Title VII or the Americans with a Disability Act or even Age Discrimination and Employment Act. However, in order for an employer to be covered, they still had to have the requisite number of employees, right? And so under the Title VII, um, employer has to employ at least 15 individuals. That's the same with Americans with Disability Act. The employer has to also employ at least 15 individuals. Now, it's a little different in regards to the Age Discrimination and Employment Act. The employer has to employ at least 20 individuals to be covered and for you to be able to file a complaint um, with the EEOC. Yeah. So if, if the EOC says, look, you know, you've told us that the, the, the employer doesn't have 15 or uh, 20 employees, so we can't enforce um, uh, do an investigation or do any um, investigation or enforce any of the, the law um, because they don't they don't have the number, the requisite number of employees. What I would still do is, I know I'm going to say this throughout this video, is contact an attorney because sometimes there are other statutes that could be applicable. Uh, one in particular could be Section 1981, where if you believe your employer is discriminating against you on the basis of your race, then you can still file a complaint under Section 1981 and basically you're filing directly to in federal court. Um, so that's still an option for you. Fourth, you're going to say it says your charge was not timely filed with the EOC. In other words, you waited too long after the dates of the alleged discrimination to file your charge, right? So we know um, in the state of Indiana that you have at least 300 days to file your complaint if you are a private employee with the EOC. And right, so that means that if you were terminated um, 301 days before you try to file your complaint with the EOC, you are then time barred. So you cannot file your complaint with the EOC because you're, you're barred by time. And that's one of the things that I hate to say to any of uh, people who contact me is, hey, you waited too long. Because typically these people have cases. It's just that sometimes they're afraid or sometimes, you know, you're so caught up with a termination or suspension of promotion that's hard to move on. Um, but when you were 
receive these charges or when you believe that you've been discriminated against um, based on your protected class, you need to contact an attorney or contact the EEOC and get that charge filed as soon as possible. Um, even if you believe, hey, it's kind of scurry, I don't know if this is really discrimination or not, I would still contact an attorney or contact the EEOC directly because if you could have, if you should have filed a charge and you just wait a, a later on, there's no way to go back and, and, to, and change that. So I'd rather be safe and sorry and get that charge filed as soon as possible. Um, lastly, and this is the one where I typically see all the time this check. And that's why I kept to check on um, this redacted document. It says the EOC issues the following determination. Based on its investigation, the EOC is unable to conclude that the information obtained establishes a violations of the statutes. This does not certify that the respondent is in compliance with the statutes. No finding is made as to any other issues that might be construed as having been raised by this charge. Y'all, I've been practicing employment law for the last probably seven, eight years. And I have always, every single time I file a complaint or charge of discrimination with the EOC, that one is checked. It does not matter if my client has a great case where the person tells them directly, we're, we're terminating you because you're a woman, that is, charged, that is filed, that's checked, okay? And so when you get an EOC charge and that one is checked, it does not mean you do not have a case. Okay, it does not, I mean, let me say it again. It does not mean you do not have a case, right? Much on the contrary, you probably do have a case and you might have a case, okay? What has happened is, is that the EEOC has probably taken your information, right? You filed that charge of discrimination. The EEOC has requested a position statement from your, your past employer. They've received it, they've read over it, and then they've issued a, a right to sue letter because they cannot make a determination if the, the discrimination has occurred or not. And that's because the EEOC, y'all, they get tons of calls, tons of charges that are filed, and they cannot do the in-depth investigation that a private attorney can do. It's just, they just can't, they don't have the manpower to do so. And so the EEOC typically is gonna check that the EEOC is, is gonna issue a determination. It's, it's saying, look, I'm not saying you don't have a case, but I'm not saying you do have a case. I'm saying that you need to figure out, you need to move forward probably, probably in the federal and file a federal lawsuit. And that's gonna be determined if you know if you have a case or not. And so do not be dismayed if that, that that's checked. What I would do is as soon as you receive your right to sue letter, I would then contact an employer and say, look, you know, I received this right to sue letter. This is the check. This is this this one was checked. What do I do next? Okay, and then then go from there. But don't let it don't make you think or don't think that you don't have a case because that one's checked. That is just not true at all. And, and I, I know I'm belaboring that point, but it's because of the fact that I've had even my clients sometimes say, Amber, I received this, so the case is over. I'm like, no, the case is really just beginning because typically that's going to be the uh, what the EOC checks in these discrimination cases, and you just have to go through the next process, which is filing a lawsuit in federal court which I would definitely advise you to contact an attorney when you do so. So and the last one is the EOC has adopted the findings of the state or local fair employment practices agency that investigated this charge. This is going to be checked when you file a complaint or file a charge with the Indiana Civil Rights Commission if you're in Indiana. So it's your state um, agency that, that investigates discrimination. In the state of Indiana, it's the Indiana Civil Rights Commission. If you live in another state, it could be something else. Um, or it, it, honestly, even if you live and you may have filed a charge in Gary, I know Gary has a, a Gary Human Relations um, Department that also investigates um, these matters as well. And so the EOC is saying, look, I'm I'm going to adopt whatever they 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 stated in regards to your case. And sometimes they say that yeah, you do you, and this discrimination has occurred, or, or more than likely they've the um, state agency has stated that you don't there's no charge that has, no discrimination that has been found. Again, that does not mean you don't have a case. It just means that. That, um, when they just look at your charge and your position statement, they're stating that you they could not find any discrimination, which is not a very in-depth look at any of this. So don't, again, don't get um, dismayed regarding that because it just means that they couldn't, with their resources, actually investigate and, and look and just determine if you've been discriminated against. 
Okay. And then it's other, which is briefly say, I've never seen them do a, a briefly say anything. So um, that's typically not what's going to um, be checked. And so then this is the part, right? Notice of rights. So it says the Title VII, the Americans with Disability Act, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, or the Age Discrimination and Employment Act. So this applies to these statutes. This will be the only notice of dismissal of your right to sue that we will send to you. You may file a lawsuit against the respondents under federal law based on this charge in federal or state court. Your loss must be filed, right? And must be filed within nine days of your receipt of this notice or your right to sue based on this charge will be lost. The time limit for filing suit based on the claim under state law may be different. Okay, I'm just gonna stop and stop right there. Y'all, this is so important. If you get nothing out of this case besides the the check, the, the EOC checking, the EOC issues the fall determination, the other por portion I want you to get out of this, this video is in regards to you have 90 days to file suit, right? So when you when it says you have 90 days to file suit, you need to look at this date right here, where it says on this one, it says August 20th, 2019. You have 90 days from this date to file suit. Do not sit around, do not um throw this in your pile of junk mail if you are serious about filing your lawsuit you need to contact an attorney and discuss your charge of discrimination with that attorney you don't have to contact this one you can contact multiple attorneys so you can get an understanding if you have a case or not but you have 90 days right from this date right from this date to file that lawsuit if you do not file your lawsuit Within that time frame, you cannot pursue your case. And it, when you don't pursue your case, that means that you are losing out on a significant amount of money. Okay. And we'll talk about it in another video, but that's why this is really important. You want to make sure that you adhere to these deadlines so you can receive the recovery that you deserve. Secondly, it's going to be the Equal Pay Act, or what we call typically is this the EPA. The EPA suits must be filed in federal or state court within two years, three years for wolf violations of the alleged EPA underpayment. This means that back pay due to any violations that occur more than two or three years before your suit may be not collectible. Right. So that's why it's really important when you have um, an Equal Pay Act violation, you want to make sure you get that filed. ASAP, right? Because what was happening is if you wait, you have two or three years to get it filed. Yeah, that's true. So you have time, but the longer you wait, the less it can go back, right? And so the EPA is a Lilly Ledbetter Act that was actually signed into law by President Obama says that each paycheck that you receive is a violation of the EPA. And so, so let's say that your last paycheck with your employer was a year ago, okay? So you then have, but you've been working for your employer for about seven, eight years. You had that last paycheck was a year ago, so 2020 now. 2020 was your last paycheck from your employer. You're waiting a year, right, to, to actually file suit. So you fall suit because you have that two to three years. I would, I would, I would actually share with the two because it's very inter it's interpretation by a judge if if it's willful, right? And so you have that two years, so you wait that year. You're going to go back to the year in which you've had um, been paid uh, unfairly. And then you can go back two to three years after that. And it's really just two to maybe three years after from the day in which you have terminated. And so that's why it's really important if when you are being paid unequally, you need to hop on that and say, look, I'm being paid unequally. And this is year five working there. So then you are not basically losing out on a lot of money that you could have recovered because of the discrimination, right? That's why you have to, timing is everything in these cases. And that's why you wanna make sure that you actually um, are paying attention to the time that's elapsing. 
Okay, and so at the end, it's going to be the CC. Usually the CC is going to be either, it's going to be um, the, the, the employer's address. It's typically either, either could be their, their attorney that they've hired to um, respond to the EEOC charge, or it could just be the human resources. It's, it's their address. And then last, it's going to be my address, right? Or your attorney's address. It's going to be on there because we're going to receive that EEOC right to sue directly. And that's why it's really important also to, to me, I have an attorney. The attorneys typically that we don't move a lot, right? We just have a place. Look, this is our office. This is where we're at. This is where we see these EEOC right to sue letters. And so it's very, very important for, for you to have an attorney that's going to recover that um, the charge. And then they'll give you a call and say, look, we've received this. What do you want to do? Let's move forward. Let's get this case filed in federal court. All right. After you, are, you receive your right to sue letter, you review your right to sue letter, you now need to contact an attorney. I know, <laughs> I know that's probably not something that you wanted to hear, but you need an attorney when you're dealing with this case because first you want to talk to an attorney, an employment law attorney, to determine if you actually have a viable claim. A employment law attorney who deals with these cases on a day-to-day -day basis is going to be able to sit with you talk to you, listen to the facts of your case, and determine if you have a winnable claim. Once that attorney talks to you and determines you have a winnable claim, then you need to pursue a federal lawsuit. And that's not something you can do by yourself. That's why you have to contact an attorney. Federal court is very different from small claims court, and it's actually very different from Indiana state court or state court in general. Federal court, it, it, to put it lightly, it's intimidating. I'm even intimidated when I attend federal court myself. And it's for several reasons. One, you don't have just one judge in federal court. You have two judges in federal court. Also, when you file a case in federal court, there's going to be a host of things that you have to make sure you do. And you have to do those things timely. One is you have to make sure that you submit your discovery, which is any questions you that want your former employer to respond to. Also, you want to submit what's called request for production of documents. That means any documents that you believe your employer has and you believe that if you receive them are, are going to help your case. Also, you're going to want to depose the decision maker, your manager, in um, regards to the discrimination that you experience. And guess what? They're going to do the exact same to you. And you're going to want to make sure that you have an attorney who is advising you through that process. So making sure that you answer those questions correctly, making sure you provide the correct documentation, and definitely making sure they prepare you for a deposition. And that's why you need an employment law attorney. Also, lastly, make sure you actually are hiring an employment law attorney. Right. There are tons of attorneys out there. They're traffic court attorneys, they're family law attorneys, they're criminal law attorneys. You need to hire an employment law attorney. Employment law is filled with pitfalls. It's filled with tiny issues and it's very particular law. Right. It's not even very intuitive type of law. So you want to make sure you hire someone who deals with that type of law on a day to day basis. And it's going to be able to help you, um, one, determine if you have a case, to determine how much your case is worth. And also is going to have the experience to prepare you for those depositions and respond to that discovery. Also, you need to collect important and relevant information. Some documentation that you need to collect once you receive that right to sue letter uh, is documentation that you receive in regards to maybe your ter termination or your suspension or your demotion. Also, you're going to want to uh, collect any emails or, you know, any other documents that you receive from your employer that you believe can help your case. And lastly, and really most importantly, you're going to want to start collecting any names and contact information of your former colleagues and former co-workers. And you're going to want to do that because if you have the right attorney, that attorney is going to say, look, let me get those names. Let's get those contact information and let me talk to that uh, those colleagues so I can draft what's called an affidavit. And you want to turn that's going to do that because some information or some um, things that you're going to allege happen, they're not may not be documentation that they have, right? You may be saying, Amber, you know what X, Y, and Z occurred. 
And then when I get all the documentation back from your employer, I can't show the X, Y, Z occurred because that wasn't documented. But you know what? Having another person uh, corroborate your testimony and say, yeah, this X, Y, Z occurred. You may not see documentation that it did occur, but they have personal knowledge that it occurred is going to help your case. And it's most times it can make or break your case. So it's very important to collect that information. Now, lastly, and I think sometimes most importantly to some people, there are certain damages that you can recover when you file a complaint with the federal court, right? So once you receive that right to sue letter, you know the next step is to file in federal court. Now the damages you can incur are kind of a raise, probably about three pools of damages. And the first pool of damages was called lost wages. Now I have a handy dandy whiteboard, you know, sometimes I'll bring it out every once in a while. And this whiteboard kind of gives you an idea of some of the damages you can collect. First, lost wages. So let's just say this. Let's say you work at a company and you um, receive a $50,000 salary. You've been off of work for about a year. God forbid it was a year. So you already have $50,000 worth of lost wages that you can recover when you file your lawsuit. Okay, so we have the $50,000 there. You also can recover what's called compensatory damages due to the discrimination you experienced. And so let's say you like, look, I got $50,000 worth of lost wages. You know, I'm going to say that I have $100,000 worth of compensatory damages. You know, you went to a therapist. The therapist may have put you on any type of medicine, prescribed medicine to you. So you said, look, I want $100,000 worth of compensatory damages. You may be able to get more under Title VII as well. You can recover that. You also can recover what's called punitive damages if you go to trial. Punitive damages are going to be recoverable when the jury determines that your employer needs to be punished for their actions. It's a tight recovery, but it is recoverable. So you all, if you've got nothing out of this video, what I want you to understand is one, once you receive that right to sue letter, it's time to act. It's not time for you to sit around and think about it. It's time to take some proactive measures to determine if you want to proceed with your lawsuit. Because you do know that you only have 90 days to proceed once you receive that right to sue letter. So the sooner you act, the sooner you get the information that's going to be relevant and it's going to prepare you to move forward with your lawsuit, the better. Also, you all, I want you to understand that you need to hire an employment law attorney. You don't have to hire me, but hire someone who's actually experienced in this area of the law. Believe me, everyone doesn't practice employment law just like everybody doesn't practice criminal law. So get somebody who's actually going to be able to thoroughly represent you. You all. I hope this video was helpful. If it was, please like and share it because I wanna make sure other individuals have access to this content so they can understand their employment law rights and they can understand what to do when those rights are violated. You all, our goal is to gain at least 10,000 subscribers in 2021. So if you could subscribe and you can share it, I greatly appreciate it. And as always, please enjoy your lunch break. Have a great day.